it's a sad chapter in the NBA because, you know, teams like cities like Seattle, when you have history and, you know, you have people who have um, nostalgia to fall back on and you have people who, you know, who've loved that team for a long time are going to stay with it through good times and bad. You're, you're running the risk in this market like Oklahoma City where they have no history with pro basketball. And if the team's not very good, and it's not going to be good for a while if, if they ever get it going again, um, once the novelty wears off of having an NBA team in town, do they keep coming to games? Do they keep supporting it? And, and, and that's the risk you run. First game uh, back in '67, the community really came together to support uh, the Sonics, even on the, the down days over the years until uh, the '70s. Then they started picking up and, and we started getting better players and, and being more competitive. And you know, it's just been uh, it's been a great experience. been going to the games ever since I was a little kid. Growing up watching guys like Spencer Haywood, Slick Watts, Fred Brown, Sean Kemp, Gary Payton, clear to this year to Durant, you know. I mean, finally we get a rookie of the year and now we're losing all of that. So it's a pretty scary world. The, the NBA is running out of cities, running out of new markets. I mean, they can play the shell game of moving teams around and, you know, there are different teams in different markets, you know, who, who want to move, who threaten to move. Um, you know, Sacramento has not been able to get that arena done and, you know, there was a sense that the Maloofs would like to have the team in Las Vegas where they live most of the year. Um, but since, since the Tim Donahue scandal, I think the league is probably, just from a PR standpoint, maybe a little more red reticent about going to um, Las Vegas. But, you know, markets like Kansas City, which is an old NBA market, St. Louis, you know, they've talked about the league, but there's no great sense that the league is going to be any more successful in places like that. And you're seeing in Markets around the NBA like Atlanta and Memphis, um, uh, you know, New Jersey until they're able to get that team to Brooklyn, you know, teams are struggling to draw. That's why there's such talk now about, um, about the league going abroad, playing in Europe or playing in China. Just being here for the energy of the crowds, being here for Nate McMillan's jersey retirement, Spencer Haywood's jersey retirements, uh, all these guys, Gus Williams jersey retirement, the big finals push in the 96 season, watching Jordan play on that floor, I mean, things like that, you know, they're priceless, but now they're pretty much history. But talking to guys from there, like Jason Terry, Marvin Williams, those kind of guys who are in the NBA now, you know, they always, Nate Robinson, they talk about how, to them, the Seattle like was basketball, but it, it wasn't until they got Peyton and Kemp that that really, really turned Seattle into one of the basketball hotbeds in the NBA. But you look at all those guys now who are in the NBA, like Nate, Marvin, all those guys, they grew up on Kemp and Peyton, you know, like maybe that's why there's such an influx of Seattle guys in the NBA right now. It's very disappointing, you know, for not just for myself, but everybody in the community. Everybody's really disappointed, but we're just hoping the team can hurry up and get back here. You know, um, even when I wasn't here, you know, I'm still from play for the New York Knicks, but I was always watching the Seattle Supersonics games and, and talking to Kevin Durant and those guys all throughout the season. Like I said, you have guys from here. We have, I think, like 15 guys from the state of Washington in the NBA now, and we all play for our respective teams, but we all support the Sonics, so we're all hoping they can get back here. Born and raised in Seattle, uh, I, I, I think that my favorite memory is in 1978 
the day that we won the uh, championship, uh, me and my son, my son had just been born, me and my son, he was about three months old, we got down, we sat down and watched the Sonics win the uh, world championship. That kind of got me on the basketball path. And uh, it's had, a, it's had a, a positive effect on every kid who's played basketball in the state of Washington. Sean Kemp was really, like, he was made for the YouTube era, you know? I mean, he should have been the guy getting traded around on emails and viral videos and all this stuff, but it didn't exist when he came around. So, like, when he got that dunk in the garden against the Knicks where he, you know, brought it down and reversed it, that was kind of like, that started popping up on SportsCenter and all those weird, like, George Michael sports machine, all these weird shows that would come up. So that was the only chance you could see those dunks. And then the NBA would make those videotapes highlight tapes, and that was where Sean Kemp got known. It's very sad, very sad. I think a lot of times that's what happens when politics get involved with sports. You know, it's a bad thing. So, uh, I mean, it's sad for the, the fans. You know, so many people enjoy going to Seattle. They're going to miss going to Seattle these days. And so all of a sudden, there's this 19-year-old kid on the scene who's, you know, got the body of a 31-year-old dunking on dudes, running up and down the floor, catching alley-oops from Peyton. Like, you know, him and Peyton were so exciting that I think a lot of kids, you know, it was before the N1 tours and mixtapes and all that stuff, so I think a lot of kids saw street ball in the Sonics. Gary Payton, definitely one of the most exciting players in, you know, my era as a NBA fan. I mean, we're talking about a guy that was relatively under-recruited coming out of high school, you know, ended up at Oregon State pretty rare place for a top player to go. Always had a chip on his shoulder, I think dating back to high school and from having a father that was, you know, instilled a lot of toughness in him. So like not being, not being that big of a guy uh, and then just playing really hard and then throw in the trash talking. You know, the guy was just fun to watch as a tough dude. Kemp and Peyton were like as close to a video game or a mixtape or any of that stuff as there was at the time. You know, and Peyton didn't really, do, I mean, he was more of a defender than anything else. But he could lob the ball up there, and Kemp would just go get it, no matter where it was. Sean flushed it, and uh, you know I think for a lot of kids they were kind of aspirational. That left shrimp because he was most improbable in the era, and he dominated at his position and he did it well for a good long number of years. And uh, I've been a fan of his because uh, I like people who can endure, and he endured. The, the, the Sonics history now just sort of goes into a limbo. You know, you, you, you think about, um, you know, the. the Teams in you know '95 that gets to the NBA Finals and you know with with you know Sean Kemp the Rain Man and 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 Gary Payton and you know loses to Jordan's Bulls um, you know those were great teams those were 60 win teams in the West for a long time and 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 through the years you just had very very good teams in Seattle with real loyal followings and and what do you do as a fan now where do you go to to sort of keep these memories and collect these memories and um, you know unless they get a team back there and they can put that uniform back on in that city and, 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 and restart it, um, you know, people are going to forget there were, you know, uh, people are going to forget that the Sonics were there. I mean, they're going to, they're going to forget in a lot of ways, um, the history and that, and that's sad. And that is, to me, that's devastating for the NBA because, you know, again, Seattle was just, it was one of, to me, one of the special historic cities in the league, one of the real good NBA cities. Um, they had the great rivalry with Portland there and, and it's all lost. And, and, um, I, I don't know how you recapture it. See, my thought about the whole basketball move to Oklahoma City from the Sonics, you know, uh, it's a disappointment. Obviously, uh, let down is business, I understand that, and that's sort of the way it goes. But I'm a guy born and raised in Portland, Oregon, two hours from Seattle. And so I'm used to having the Sonics here. Seattle was like a, a second home game for me. 
because Portland was like my road game when I was with the Lakers that had all my family there, but this was the second spot that had the most family representation. I've uh, been down in Mexico and I found cats who were from Latvia who were Sonics fans. I loved them. And I'll be damned if I come back home and they're talking about taking away the whole team. They traded Peyton to Milwaukee and Ray Allen came in. Deadly three-point shooter. I mean, like one of the best of his era, definitely. So, you know, Ray Allen's probably the last guy they'll cling to as the last basketball, the last Sonics superstar. Like, you know, they kind of peaked popular-wise during the, the Peyton and Kemp years. But he, you know, Allen made sure they didn't disappear, though. They might not have been as popular as some other teams. They weren't irrelevant either. Finally, we get a rookie of the year, and now we're losing all of that. So it's a pretty scary world. Kevin Durant came out of college as one of the most hyped college players in recent memory. Uh, went to Seattle. The team had been down for a few years. They really hadn't had a superstar probably since uh, Gary Payton left or Ray Allen left. And so um, they traded Ray Allen, get Durant, and uh, he was great immediately. And now you know, he wins Rookie of the Year and now he's gone. So the city really never got a chance to like rally around him or, or really get to see what kind of player he's going to become. Because as great as he was now, he's going to get stronger and more experienced. He's going to be amazing in two or three years. You know, they were friends to us, you know? They, they, it didn't matter what happened after the game. If, you came, if Kevin came outside and it was 200 people, he would not go home until he signed those 200 autographs. And they would sit there and, and speak to us every night. And um, um, Earl became friends with uh, my grandson, Curtis. And um, I mean, he even been over the house. But I never trust commercial bourgeois businessmen to do anything else other than follow the dollar. They are not spiritual, they are not cultural, they are not concerned about the hometown regional fans of the Sonics. They are concerned about their own pocketbooks. My name's Aaron, Aaron Claxon, I'm assistant athletic director here at Rotary. And uh, basketball going all day, almost every day. And we love what we do up here. Right, man, the glove, locking down on D, playing that ball, playing that killer ball, you gotta love that. You gotta love the ball. Because Kevin Durant and Jeff Green was gonna do good this year, and I think the Sonics was gonna do good. Uh, my son is number 42, William Jefferson. Yeah, we retain the name and the colors, so we'll we'll have another Sonics team. I believe that. You know, Clay Bennett was a millionaire from Oklahoma, and he and a group of you know, a group of investors bought the Sonics when Howard Schultz was selling them in Seattle, right in the middle of the difficulties they were having with getting a new arena built. And everybody's suspicion from the beginning were, were that he wanted to move that team to Oklahoma City. The Hornets had come and played in Oklahoma City after Katrina. They saw the great fan support there and, and the fact that the, the market could support the team. And, and from the very beginning, there was a sense um, of people questioning his sincerity. Um, about wanting to, to actually get a new arena built in Seattle and keep that team there. The Sonics uh, couldn't get a deal with the city, with the arena, as far as I know. The guy from Oklahoma City uh, said he was going to make a good faith effort to keep the team in Seattle, but, you know, they got out of there pretty fast. <laughs> like, they didn't last that long with him in charge in Seattle. Everyone was waiting on the judge's decision the mayor secretly was making deals with Clay Bennett and ultimately sold the team. I, 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 thought, that's, I thought that was pretty tragic. Um, and last year I was a full season ticket holder, but the year before I missed four games. Now, 
I, don't, I hope, hopefully, I'm included in that settlement if they allow us to go to games in Oklahoma City. And I believe that Oklahoma, from the Jump Street, had a plan, and that was to move this team out and the opportunity there with Stearns and um, uh, the Oklahoma uh, ownership was in cahoots, I hate to say it. So, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, Clay Bennett had money, and he came in, decided uh, the team might, he wanted to move the team to his city, Oklahoma City, and, you know, he had the money. He was able to pay off whoever he needed to pay to handle the contracts that were outstanding and get the team in Oklahoma City. You know, if someone in Seattle had stepped up with that money, the team could still be in Seattle right now, but as it turned out, no one was willing to, to put the money on the line to keep the team there. An email from uh, one of his uh, investors, one of his part owners came out where he basically said, you know, we've, all, we've always wanted to bring them to Oklahoma City. That's always been our plan. The league fined him $250,000, and yet Stern, it really upset people when Stern never left the side of his owner, and it shows you in this day and age, you know, David Stern works for the owners, and Clay Bennett was his owner, and that's where his loyalty was. It was not to Seattle, it was not to the market, even though I think in a perfect world, Stern would rather have a team in Seattle than, than Oklahoma City. Nobody locally bought the team from uh, the Starbucks owner, and, and he, then he sold it to someone from Oklahoma City, and they, you know, were obviously gonna probably take him to Oklahoma City. When you lose a team in the middle of the off season, you don't really have a whole lot to say, and that's where a lot of people are at right now. They're just kind of like in limbo. Like what happened in Charlotte with George Shin, people became so anti the owner, they were never going to give him the arena, they were never going to give him the public funding for it, and it was inevitable that the team was going to leave. Um, and then once it, you know, the city finally let uh, the Sonics out of their lease, let Bennett take take him to Oklahoma City, um, they basically paid out um, you know, $45 million to be able to leave and break the lease. I would be mad that there's no Sonics here anymore because now you can't come watch a professional basketball anymore. And it's not going to be as fun. But once the season hits, people are going to realize, you know, with the NBA not being here, it's going to suck. They kept the history of the team. Um, and so if they're able to get another team in Seattle, um, they'll be able to have the name and be able to keep the records, but um, they go to Oklahoma City where, listen, they've sold out season tickets where people are, are enthusiastic about having a team there. Um, they get it, you know, they do a contest, they get a name, it's the Thunder. And, and really, it's, it's a sad chapter in the NBA because, you know, teams like, cities like Seattle, when you have history and, you know, you have people who have um, nostalgia to fall back on and you have people who you know, who've loved that team for a long time are gonna stay with it through good times and bad. You're running the risk in this market like Oklahoma City where they have no history with pro basketball and if the team's not very good, and it's not gonna be good for a while if, if they ever get it going again, um, once the novelty wears off of having an NBA team in town, do they keep coming to games, do they keep supporting it? And, and, and that's the risk you run. One way or the other, I want to see a professional team here, okay? And I certainly hope it's the Sonic because we have too much history uh, that is involved, that's been a part of us since we were kids. And my kids, you know, we always talk about the different players coming up and they get excited. Now it's like, wow, the dream is, is, is like gone. And it's a shame because I think people in Seattle, um, um, I think they're going to miss that team.